introduce you to Dr. Devin Henson, who is our Vice Provost and Chief Academic Officer, uh, for his support of this partnership and particularly for writing a check for all this good stuff that we're doing today. Um, so in addition to the support of our institutions, we also appreciate the support and advocacies of partners at the state level as well. Those of you who were with us last year for the, for the inaugural summit, the first summit, um, heard from Dr. John Gardner about the implementation of an action plan for transfer excellence that was created by a statewide task force that included representations from both of, of our schools and, and schools all across the state. A great deal of work centered around recommendations in that plan has taken place over the course of the past year. And uh, Dr. Kristen Brooks, who is going to be speaking with us today, has been key to the progress made on several of those initiatives. Dr. Brooks is the Senior College Completion Program Manager at the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education. She coordinates statewide efforts to increase readiness, persistence, and post-secondary completion for South Carolinians. More specifically for our partnership, Dr. Brooks is a tireless leader for interinstitutional teams that are charged with bringing those task force recommendations to life. Let me tell you, she is a pro at facilitating cross-functional and data-driven collaboration. She can keep a meeting on task like nobody's business, and she's my hero for that. Um, but she is committed to enhancing the transfer student experience in South Carolina. She holds bachelor's and master's of art degrees in English literature and cultural studies from Linden State College, and a doctor of education from Northeastern University. We are so excited to have Dr. Brooks with us today to give us an update on the South Carolina Transfer Excellence Plan, and I ask that you would join me in welcoming Dr. Kristen Brooks. Well, welcome, hello, good morning. So excited to be here, and thank you so much, Donna Zeke, for that very warm introduction. Um, I really love these spaces. It is an opportunity to share our knowledge, find new ways to collaborate, and really immerse ourselves in this transfer conversation. So I am grateful to Donna and Amanda for the invite today. Um, speaking in front of a lot of people is like a roller coaster for me. It's the anticipation. Oh, hi, Jennifer. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. The anticipation, right? Those butterflies, and you're up here, and you're like, oh, okay, here we go. So, my name is Kristen. Call me Kristen. I am, as Donna said, the Senior College Completion Program Manager at the Commission on Higher Education. You can see that on the screen, but what you don't see on the slide is that I'm actually an eight-time transfer student. That's right, eight. Eight. Didn't have a great path, didn't know what I wanted to do, really wishy-washy. I am not first generation, though, right? My parents went to college. I just kind of did my own thing, right? But I finished, and I finished with the help of people like you in this room. So with that support, I finished my associate degree first at 23, then I finished my bachelor's at 25, my master's at 27, and then just a couple years ago, I completed my doctoral degree. So it is possible. It's possible for me, and it's possible for a lot of the students in South Carolina. So throughout my educational journey, I've been an advocate for students like me, and I'm honored to be here today to share in the summit that will lead to better transfer student outcomes at the University of South Carolina Columbia and Midlands Technical College and also the entire state of South Carolina. So while we're here today to share the last eight months of work that's been completed by the Transfer Council, before I get started, I wanna provide some con considerations as you think through your own work in current partnerships. I have a lot of slides, I have a lot of information, right? Zone in, zone out, do whatever you need to do to be comfortable. It's eight months of work and it is a lot of work. And so I wanna make sure that you all are aware there's gonna be a lot happening and you can get as comfortable as you need to get comfortable to, to engage in whatever ways is best for you. 
So according to the latest Community College Research Center report, we've got two-year transfer students who earn a credential prior to transfer having stronger post-transfer outcomes, right? I want you to ask yourself, what does this mean for your specific institution, right? At the two-year level and at the four-year level. What <coughs> policies, procedures, and practices are in place to ensure all students are leaving the two-year institution with a credential? Two-year transfer students are less likely to earn a bachelor's degree in STEM fields compared to non-transfer students. Again, what does this mean for your institution? How strong are your STEM partnerships and what barriers are specifically associated with STEM transfer pathways? Then those vertical transfer students are retained at higher rates. Right, think about that. This partnership is integral to have those transfer students completing those bachelor's degrees. You're sitting in this room today at a summit focused on partnerships between two institutions, a four-year and a two-year, and that support commits both of you to that transfer student. As we work together to enhance statewide transfer to better support South Carolina transfer students, these considerations are imperative as we begin thinking about the benefits of even completing a college degree. And I appreciate the welcomes from Dr. Arnett and Dr. Reigns as well because they set up my speech really, really well for me. So I am grateful for that. Dr. Reigns talked about what's happening in the national conversation with higher education, right? There's all this skepticism happening right now, some negative news out there. It's really nothing new, right? Higher ed ebbs and flows in the minds of of citizens. So currently there are many conversations swirling about the return on investment. I think this slide speaks to the ROI and in 2023 the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics released their educational attainment earnings data. Here you can not only see the increase in median weekly earnings as additional degrees are attained but also the decrease in unemployment rates based on having those degrees. We know the cost of higher education has increased over time and student loans are becoming more and more burdensome for families and individuals. Students are becoming more financially aware, creating a draw to two year more affordable institutions. To increase those earnings, students must move from those two year institutions into those four year institutions. But the ROI conversation does not work unless transfer works. In addition to the differences in median work weekly earnings, there's also significant differences in lifetime earnings according to the 2015 Social Security Administration data. Men have the potential to increase their gross lifetime earnings by $670,000 if they attain that bachelor's degree. Women have the potential to increase their gross lifetime earnings by, by $420,000. We won't talk about gender inequities here today. I'm always happy to have those conversations offline. But currently we have 500,000 500, individuals with some college and no degree across our state. Right, so that's men and women across the state who have some college and no degree. They started, they've got some student loans, they haven't completed yet, and they're just kind of hanging out out there. I would urge you to remember the considerations and this earning data. The urgency to better recruit, retain, and graduate transfer students is clear. Institutions cannot do it alone, as Dr. Kirk had mentioned earlier, right? It takes relationships. It takes strong partnerships and foundational understanding of data and needs, both institutional needs and student needs. So I want to take a little bit of a look at national numbers, right? Just get some of this stuff on your radar and we'll start paring it down into state numbers and then we'll jump into the actual work. So this is also taken from the Community College Research Center's recent tracking transfer report. So they release that report annually, it comes out in February, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. So this is their fall 2015 cohort numbers. Approximately 80% of two-year students indicate an interest in transferring. Approximately 33% of those students transfer, and then um, approximately 48% who transfer complete that bachelor's degree. We've heard these numbers time and time again since about 2007, okay? 
These first three numbers have remained largely unchanged. We hear the 80, 33, 17. There's been slight movement, but only about one or two percentage points up or down, right? But we're, we're pretty steady in what these numbers look like nationally. Then we've got approximately 44% of those who transferred did so with an associate degree or some kind of certificate. And then approximately 75% of transfer students are vertical transfer students. This reinforces the need for those strong two and four year partnerships, not just in South Carolina, but across the country. So while the national data is really important, we also need to understand where we're coming at as a state. So approximately 29% of two year students transfer to a four year institution. This is about four percentage points less than the national average. Approximately 17% of those who transferred did so with a certificate or associate degree. I'm not gonna lie, this number is really scary for me. It wakes me up at night, I've had lots of conversations about this. South Carolina is the lowest in the country for students transferring with a certificate or an associate degree. We're well below the national average by 27%. That's huge. Especially when we start talking about here, right, where two-year students who earn a credential prior to transfer have stronger post-transfer outcomes. And we only have about 17% of students who are completing a certificate or an associate degree before moving on to their four-year institution. And I'll just throw out there, Louisiana is right above us at 27%. There is a significant gap for our two-year certificates and associate degree attainment before transfer. So I'll ask you again, what does this mean for your institution? Right? What policies, procedures, and practices are in place to ensure all students are leaving to your institutions with a credential? Lastly, we've got approximately 49% of those who transferred completed their bachelor's degree in six years. Right? That's pretty good. 49%. What you don't see on the slide is that only 14% earn their bachelor's degree within four years of transferring. So those are some pretty heavy numbers, right? But that's why we're here today. Because there's lots of room for growth and you are doing that right now. So you can see in the data why South Carolina has committed to addressing transfer barriers, right? If we were doing great things, we could probably ease off a little bit and focus in some other areas, right? But we're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of room for growth. As I mentioned previously, relationships and partnerships and understanding are key components to enhancing the transfer student success. South Carolina has made intentional choices in, the, in these areas through seeking those external partnerships with national transfer leaders and champions. Right, Dr. Gardner came and spoke last year with you all. We've engaged with him at the state level as well. He's worked with many of the institutions. We also had a number including Bill and Jennifer Nia, um, a number of people attending the National Institute for Transfer Student, um, for the Institute for the Study of Transfer Students, I'm sorry, conference, that annual conference, coming together with national leaders, hearing what's happening at different states, all of those are important things as we continue to enhance transfer in South Carolina. Enhancing the state partnerships with all two and four year public and participating independent institutions. This is something that we do at the state level. It's what Donna was mentioning through our transfer council work. It's bringing people together and sharing those promising practices. What's happening across the campuses? What are some things that are working really well? What are some things that need to be better? And then the General, General Assembly approved the transfer proviso 117-135. This transfer proviso is what has allowed CAG to embark on this transfer work. They specifically directed us to 
work in collaboration with a technical college system, two year, four years, independent institutions, any stakeholder that works within this transfer space is welcome into those meetings to have the conversation. And we're looking to implement those six recommendations outlined in the transfer action plan. And ultimately that implementation of the transfer articulation and action plan is going to allow us to put mechanisms in place to better understand student mobility across the state. The success of, the tra of transfer in South Carolina spans beyond the institutions, and we have seen this through these different areas of commitment by the state. But we don't wanna diminish your work, right? Even though transfer also sits outside of institutions through state level work, legislation, unfortunately, right? There's so many things that have to happen at the institution level. And so we want to start bringing all of this to the table and sharing out what's happening. So let's talk about the work, right? South Carolina has been doing transfer since the 1970s, but the state has reaffirmed that commitment to, the tra to transfer student success in June, 2021. So you can see that at the very beginning of this timeline, they secured a grant through the Educational Credit Management Corporation, Gardner Institute, and the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. So this was really the catalyst for getting this transfer work up and running. So between August of 21 and January 23, the transfer task force, which was associated with the grant, created the transfer and articulation action plan. This action plan can be found on the commission's website. If you haven't Seen it, I would encourage you to take a look. It's very detailed and it kind of gives you the background and information about where the recommendations came from. I believe Dr. Gardner was your keynote last year, right, and provided additional details. Um, it is incredibly comprehensive in terms of the holistic support for students. So we're not just talking about pathways, even though that is a huge part of your summit today you are gonna see a shift later on as I speak to really recognizing that student experience and the student need. So then in August of 23, the South Carolina Transfer Council was established. So this is where we are currently. The task force is no longer, their work concluded. We created a transfer council, which now is um, about 17 individuals who, who are part of that, or, who are part of the leadership team, but we have over 64 representatives in the entire council from institutions across the state. So we're gonna shift our focus to now why I was brought here today, which is the recommendations, okay? Recommendation one was the catalyst for the creation of the South Carolina Transfer Council. The council is comprised of institutions from across the state. It includes two-year, four-year, independent, public, you name it, we've got it, okay? The council um, representatives have deep knowledge and understanding of transfer. They work directly and or indirectly with transfer students or have the authority or access to those with authority to make decisions. And that was really important. They need to at least have a foundational understanding of what transfer is. Right? How many times do you walk into a room with people who are unfamiliar with the term transfer and you have to start from the bottom and explain? While that is good, we want to make sure we share our knowledge and bring people into the conversation. The work of the council was needing to move so quickly that we didn't have time to create that foundation for people who weren't already actively part of the conversation. So we requested presidents and provosts to send nominations of the tra transfer champions across their institution who either work directly or indirectly with students, who work with data, who end up um, really being able to make those decisions for institutions. We can't wait and run things through eight or nine or 10 different people at one institution to get an answer. We have to be able to sit in these conversations, sit in these spaces and say, yes, we're gonna move forward with this, or you know what, this isn't a good idea right now for my institution. So those decision makers were key for us. 
Here you can see the makeup of the transfer council. The council includes a leadership team. The leadership team provides oversight and guidance. They don't have a specific recommendation that they work on. They are the ones who review the information, provide additional considerations for the working groups to think about before we move it through the rest of the process at the state level So, and through faculty, to be quite honest. So our transfer leadership team is kind of that, that stopgap for us. They're gonna ask us the hard questions. They're gonna make sure we have been very intentional in the work that we're doing before we bring faculty in the conversation before we send it up to the provost, and then before ultimately, if the commission needs to approve any policies um, or structural changes, they're able to do so at that level. Then we've got our four working groups. You can see it is a well-rounded, really holistic picture of transfer students. We've got that engagement component, that communication component, technical and data, right? It is so important for us to understand transfer data. That's how we can make the best decisions with the little resources we have available to us, right? And then our academic pathways. We all know how important those pathways are. So each of these groups were assigned two recommendations and they have worked for the last eight months to implement as much of those recommendations as possible. They meet at least monthly for an hour, we do have one group who meets bi-weekly, an hour each. So people are really committing to this work and making time in their schedule to do this, even around graduation time. We really had great attendance um, at the lead up to graduation and we've got our monthly meetings next week. So we're very excited for that commitment of the institutions. So recommendation two focuses on that data and data collection, right? The technical and data working group had to collaborate to create a statewide dashboard and determine what additional transfer data the commission needed to accept, right? There's only very few data points that the commission accepts around transfer in general. And so what are some of the deeper pieces of transfer data that we wanna take a look at and include in that dashboard and how is CAG going to collect those things? So I know this slide is not easy to read, but I wanted to make sure that you had at least an image of what the dashboard looked like. So the dashboard is accessible on the commission's website under the analytics data and reports tab at the top. I would encourage everyone, not now, but at some point today or this week, to go ahead and take a deeper look at this dashboard. On this side, you can see that there are filters. So you can filter through um, institution sector. You can look at institution type, race and ethnicity. We also included Pell recipients. That was a really important piece um, for not just the data and technical working group, but the leadership team. We really wanted to see how the financial components are impacting our transfer students, all right? So the dashboard was physically created by the commission's senior researcher. She worked directly with the technical and data working group to determine the metrics and then validate the data, right? Are there any data people in here? Anybody who works in, in it? Yeah, I might see some heads nodding. That's a lot, it's a lot of work. And it took them months to go through what data we were looking at and how we were getting it and where it was coming from. There's a lot of different sources. We don't have a centralized location for this, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, complicates things a little bit. So, like the Community College Resource Center's national dashboard that they also just released this year, um, this dashboard uses a cohort model. Our data is looking at the 2014 cohort and outlines trends and includes data on graduation rates, programs, and scholarships associated with transfer students. To help users better understand the data, the uh, commission senior researcher also included her technical file. So as you can see right next to the, the purple dashboard link up there, you can click on that technical information and you can find additional analysis. And she outlines some of the limitations we face with that dashboard. So it really is um, at this point, the best thing we have for looking at statewide transfer data. In a 
comparison, right, or using conjunction with the community college resource centers dashboard, we actually get a really great picture of what's happening with transfer students across our state because they also broke down data points by state as well. So some of our findings in the dashboard um, include 59% of those who transferred um, graduated with at least one credential. And so that means certificate, associate degree, bachelor degree. Over half, so about 54%, transferred from a two-year institution. So we know a lot of our two-year institution students, th that's our transfer population, right? And then this one shouldn't be a surprise, but 54% were enrolled in a liberal arts and science, general studies, or humanities program. Right? Why, does anybody have a, any insight into why that might be? The general yeah. degree. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that strong pathway, right? That you all have spent so much time really fostering and sharing and making sure students have access to and are, and are aware of, having faculty, advisors, everybody really familiar with that pathway, it makes a difference. Those things make a difference. It takes time, right? It takes time to kind of see that reward and how students are using it, but it definitely, 54% of those students who are transparent are in those programs. So there's always challenges working with data, right? As I already mentioned, um, you know, we're working with a lot of different sources for data. And as a technical and data working group, we're helping to validate the data. We quickly realized the numbers between the institutions and the commission were never going to align. And this has to do with reporting. So the commission receives data from the institutions at the start of every semester. So institutions send us their files at the start of the semester but they report to iPads in the clearinghouse at the end of the semester. So what happens, right? Students move, things, things happen with students, they either stop out or they're shifting, a lot of stuff going on between the start and the end, right? We don't even wait until that withdrawal date to get data from you guys sometimes. So there were a lot of concerns about how we were going to make that work, and ultimately a decision just had to be made. And so the decision that was made was to go ahead and use that initial start of the semester report to pull those numbers, but that's not gonna account for any variances between the first or the start of the semester and the end of the semester. So as you're looking at that data, please kind of keep those things in the back of your mind so you can be aware. Okay, additionally, some of the numbers were really low. And so you can see bullet point three up there with FERPA. You're probably wondering like what, I don't understand what that would have to do with any of this data. We were really looking to include institution level data in the dashboard. We wanted institutions to be able to click either on an institution they were interested in or one of their partner institutions to look at some of their transfer information. We weren't gonna be able to do that as we started putting that data together, validating it, running through the filters, because you saw the filters, we were finding that some of it was leading to less than 10 students. And with less than 10 students, there's a really great chance that people can identify who they are, right? And we don't wanna do that, especially as we're looking at Pell eligible, especially as we're looking at race and gender. We wanna make sure that we were keeping that student anonymity. And in order to do that, we weren't able to then include the institution specific data. There was just gonna, it was gonna cause too many concerns and, and we wanted to be safe. So our hope is as we continue to build transfer across the state and we see an increase in those transfer numbers, that as we build out the dashboard from cohort to cohort, we'll start being able to include some institution data because our numbers will be much larger than what they currently are. Okay, recommendation three, pathways. As you know, this is the most nuanced and complex of all of the recommendations. So we're gonna move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, recommendation three. Okay. This is the only recommendation with five sub recommendations. All right. It is a beast in terms of this work. There are a lot of really complex situations. I look at Trina sitting up here. I look at Jennifer sitting up here. I see Amanda kind of moving back and forth in the back. All of these people have played a really significant role in the implementation of recommendation three. And if you wanna hear all about it and their personal experience with it, I encourage you to connect with them today. So recommendation three was assigned to the Academic Pathways Working Group, and it's really focused on the mobility of credits, all right? I will say that very intentionally we started quickly shifting from terms like transferability to applicability. Now you can imagine this has complicated the conversation even more, right? Because now we're really trying to figure out where do these credits go, not simply, oh, we'll take them, right? So we wanted to make sure that we were really specific at the onset of our work, what we were going to look at. So we decided that vertical transfer, right? Knowing what the data says about vertical transfer, knowing that's a significant pipeline for South Carolina, and knowing that we have a lot of really good work already happening in that two year to four year space. So it was vertical transfer students and then also looking at applicability of credits, okay? So there's a few things um, that I wanna make sure that I highlight. So we're gonna take a closer look at sub-recommendation A, B, and C, okay? or A, B, yes, A, B, and C. D and E are gonna come a little bit later once A, B, and C have evolved a little bit more. So we're not quite to those two sub-recommendations yet. So these are the three things I wanna highlight in this section. We're looking at the assessment of our transfer portal, right, which is currently SC Track but where are we gonna shift? Are we gonna stay with SC Track? How many people use SC Track currently? <laughs> yeah, there's less than half, right? Less than half of you in this room, which is super scary. Um, so we need to figure out what is going to work for South Carolina, okay? Then we'll take a look at that preliminary matrix. If you thought the dashboard slide was scary, that one is gonna be real interesting to look at. And then a, propose, um, a proposal for the expansion of the list of 86, right? The list of 86 has been around for a while. As I've been digging, it originally started as a list of like 43, and then moved to 70, and then moved again, and so on and so forth. So we're at 86, but we wanna look at expanding that to 135 applicable courses, <coughs> right? Not just transferable courses. So, here, the Universal Transfer Explorer, that $320,000 grant that you saw on the slide previously, South Carolina did receive a pretty substantial grant from Ithaca SNR to help launch, build, create a new national transfer portal. And this national transfer portal is modeled off the CUNY Transfer Explorer, which was released about three years ago. So if you haven't taken a look at that, I would encourage you to kind of check out CUNY's website. They've had great success and they've been all over Chronicle. They're doing a lot of the, the transfer op-eds in that work. Um, it's got some really interesting components in it that, that we think would be really beneficial for South Carolina. So the national portal is initially being created as a mobile app, right? Students are on their phones all the time. We need to meet them where they're at, right? We need to make sure that they've got a platform that's accessible wherever they are in whatever time they feel like they wanna look at transfer mobility. It also is going to integrate the data from the institution systems. And so currently all institutions send a file to Academy One to be uploaded with all the changes for SC Track twice a year. So that's where some of the discrepancy in the data comes from. We want to have a hard line into those systems and that will automatically update daily. Right, so the information will be a little bit more accurate. 
So Ithaca SNR is focused on the user experience, and so they're also doing user testing with students, faculty, and advisors. And so everybody will be able to look at that platform and, and give some feedback. During that two-year grant period, we have two cohorts. So our current cohort, um, Aiken, Denmark, Coastal, College of Charleston, and Lander. I will share with everybody that Lander has already completed their data integration phase. They have already completed their user testing phase. And they are coming to the end of kind of the required work that they have to be onboarded. They are the first institution in the country to be in this platform. So we are incredibly excited. Aiken Tech is shortly following them. So they are next in line to do some user testing. Um, so the student feedback from Lander was really positive with an emphasis on having a one-stop shop to be able to see where their credits would go, what programs would be more beneficial for them, um, and then they can start asking some more meaningful questions. Right? They do that exploratory phase, they're able to save their file, they can send their file to their advisor, they can look at it together. So it really allows more intentional, meaningful conversations in that space. Okay, please don't read this. <laughs> don't need to read any of it. It is up here for color only, okay? So focus on those colors for me. But this image is really to help you visualize the course mapping within the sub-recommendation associated with the matrix. The Pathways Working Group has been working on this matrix, outlining course equivalencies and discussing availability and applicability of general education courses. Okay, so you can see all of our tabs at the bottom. We have worked in every single one of them. We have used course enrollment information at the two-year level to see how many students are actually populating these courses. We're also looking at how frequently they're being offered at the two-year level and at the four-year level, and then we're looking at the applicability of those courses. So there is a lot happening on this matrix. Nothing has been approved or solidified yet. We are still having these conversations, and once we get to a point where we need feedback, right, the the group has agreed to things, we gotta bring those faculty in. We gotta make sure we're having these conversations with faculty to ensure that they're on the same page and they're in agreement with what we're proposing. So you can see uh, the column on the left over there, the, the green, so that's the list of 86. And the additional courses that we're proposing to include are highlighted in green. So we wanted to make sure we kept those at the forefront so we could really focus on, are these the right courses to add? Are they gonna make a, student, a difference in the student program? And so we wanted to make sure that those stood out for us so we could quickly scan what that looked like. Then we've got the yellow indicating equivalency but not applicability, right? So we've got courses that are being offered but it's not going to gen ed. It's not going to programs, it's, you know, they're gonna be elective courses, okay? And then the red is no equivalency at all. Right? I see some faces out there like, whoo. Yeah, so even in the approved list of 86 that are supposed to transfer, not necessarily apply to anything, but they're supposed to transfer, even some of those aren't transferring over. So this was a really- Well, they transfer, they're just not applicable. So they transfer as like general transfer credit, but they're not applicable to either gen ed or program. Some program. are telling us that they're not coming through at all. Okay, well for USC Columbia, they all <laughs> transfer. <laughs> for USC Columbia, they all transfer. <laughs> but they may not be, we may not have a comparable course and then so they transfer as like, you know, right. general transfer credit, but yes. Yes. Yeah. No, so we are solely focused on the list of 86 transfer courses and expanding that list. And then we ask the participating institutions to map out how those specific courses, so it's about 135 courses that they looked at, how they were mapping to general education. In, in the different institutions? 
at the different institutions. So that's the reason why there may be some red, because they may be general transfer, but they don't transfer toward anything. Correct. Like ed or program. Yeah. Correct. Yes. But there are some we have found that aren't, are not transferring. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so pretty, it's a pretty good visual there, right? Of, of how things are moving or not moving, specifically with general education. But we do have some institutions, as you can see, you know, Francis Marion included um, a lot of additional information for their courses, right? So we do know how some of these courses are even playing into majors at this point. So it gives us a really great jumping off point to be able to talk about, okay, are we expanding in the right directions? What are some additional considerations we need to be looking at? This list and a written proposal was sent over to the transfer leadership team last month. We've asked for them to start providing some feedback based on what we've shared with them and start having these conversations with faculty who are teaching some of these courses, right? We wanna start getting a broader audience associated with some of, the, some of this work specifically. So that will include faculty is our next step and then moving into the, the provost conversation and then also the commission level conversations. So using the matrix, the pathway working group can begin having more meaningful conversations with their institutions about transferability and applicability of general education courses which is again gonna help springboard us into the next conversation, which is about subsection C in that recommendation, general education learning outcomes. So again, don't try to read this slide, but this is another kind of mapping document that we created. It was really important for the Pathways Working Group as part of that vertical transfer conversation, dual enrollment has to be a part of that, right? We've got students at the two-year level who are still in high school who are getting credits and they're going to be moving to a four-year institution, okay? So we took our original list of 86, which is on this side, and we looked at the approved dual enrollment course list and we indicated which of our list of 86 courses are also on the approved dual enrollment list. Then we looked at the additional courses we were looking at including and expanding that list of 86, and we looked at how those were mapping to dual enrollment courses as well. Okay? That was gonna allow us to really understand which courses are going to be applying to dual enrollment, applying to the list of 86 or 135, or how many actually get approved, and then how those are then applying to general education. That way our dual enrollment students aren't also losing credits when they move from institution to institution. So it was important for us to at least have this foundational document. Our focus is not dual enrollment, but we do know that they are going to be a stakeholder group for us. And so we wanted to make sure that we understood how they were also playing a part of this process. Okay. So the list of 86, we ended up taking that list, then we looked at the technical college's CAC for their list of approved general education courses. We went through all of those courses and started flagging courses that were broad in scope that we might be able to add to the list of 86. So that's how we ended up starting with that expansion conversation. It was really important and we were constantly reminded by many great folks about it's got to be broad in scope. We cannot have courses that are so narrow because SACS is not going to approve those for dual enrollment. So we were really, really intentional and strategic as we were working through creating this document. Okay, so that was a lot. Right? We got a lot, of, a lot of course mapping happening, really focusing on pathways. But I wanna shift now, as I told you I would, to looking at that student experience, right? Student experience and resources. So while there's such an emphasis on course mobility, I would argue that the student experience is just as important. 
So I want to take a moment to share a comment that I found insightful. Um, I was working with a small group of transfer champions from across the, the country last Friday. Uh, we were talking about the need uh, for more emphasis about student, the student experience in something that we're co-writing together, right? So, so we're talking about um, looking beyond kind of the pathways piece and what are some of the important student experience pieces that we need to add um, to this piece that we're working on. And during this conversation, um, Emily Cottrell from the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students said, transfer has always been viewed as a moment in time. Which I thought was really fascinating, right? Just a moment in time. And that moment is enrollment, right? We've got a lot of enrollment people in this room, don't we? A lot of advisors in this room. Been going to the, the National Transfer Conference for many, many years. The majority of those folks are enrollment folks, right? Nothing wrong with enrollment. I, I've got great ties to enrollment. My, my husband has worked in enrollment for a long time. But it's just that that is a moment for these students. We have transfer admissions applications. We have course um, equivalencies happening. We've got these initial stepping stones that students have to go through. And then when they get to campus, right? What happens? Sometimes they have an orientation. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's a club. Sometimes there's not. Right? Sometimes there's specific transfer advisors for them to lean into throughout their experience. Sometimes there's not. It's pretty inconsistent across institutions for transfer level support, ongoing transfer level support. So I want everybody to start kind of thinking about, does my institution offer a moment in time for these students? And if we do, what are some small changes we can make to other areas across campus that would be more inclusive for our transfer students? Right? How can we expand that moment to an experience? Right? Something that allows them to be accepted and invited into these spaces as transfer students. And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately and thinking about it in terms of recommendation four and six and how at the state level we can start shifting from a moment, right, and such an emphasis, such an emphasis on recommendation three to what is that student experience like, right? We heard from a number of students at our last transfer convening, the statewide convening that we hold in October, and a lot of those students talked about the issues they had with their courses, right? Transferring their courses between and through institutions. But they also talked about, you know, even though I had an extra semester, that it took me to graduate, that institution made me feel like I belonged. That's why I stayed. That institution had people there who were supporting me as a transfer student. That's why I stayed. Yeah, tacked on a semester. So we know pathways are important because we want students to save that money. We want them, you know, leaving for, for life and work in a timely manner, but we also know that that experience will keep them at an institution, right? So looking at acceptance, right? Getting them into school, retaining them, and getting them to graduation. So that whole life cycle for that transfer student is gonna be important. So recommendation four and six address this. It's really talking about resources, um, and I didn't lose count. Recommendation five is coming later, so don't worry about any of that. So recommendation four and six are connected. Recommendation four is focusing on creating transfer student resources and information, right? 
while recommendation six includes the creation of awareness campaigns. So making sure students know their options, making sure students are connecting with the appropriate people, making sure that they are fully informed before they launch into the new institution. So to better understand what resources Trains for Students are using, the Student Engagement Working Group launched a statewide survey. Right? How easy is that? They had approximately 374 responses. And I just want to let people know that all of the questions were optional. And so not all of the responses added up to 374. And so it's however many of those students responded is the percentages that we're looking at, okay? So there's two particular results that the group found interesting. They asked questions for student or two students who were intending to transfer and then students who had actually already transferred, right? So there was some branching for this survey. Um, students who indicated interest in transferring were asked what barriers they anticipated facing and over 70% of those students indicated they anticipated financial barriers, right? So really conscious of the financial aspect of education, okay? And then the next highest barrier were academic barriers at 40%. And academic is really broad, so it's not just course equivalencies, but it's actually performing in courses as well. Students who had already transferred, so you're looking at this one right here, were asked what barriers they actually encountered. So academic barriers were consistent with about 40%. However, almost 60% of those students who transferred said information barriers were their issue. Right, so actual versus perceived, right? I think I'm gonna face these financial hurdles, but I'm actually, it was information that hung me up, right? And then less than 50% of students who transferred found financial barriers to be the issue, right? So still about half of them said financial was, was an issue or a concern, but really that 60, almost 60% for information barriers was just huge for us and really speaks to the need for recommendation four and six, right? All right, so not only did we survey students, we also surveyed faculty and staff, right? Majority, and this will be no surprise to anybody, majority of those respondents were advisors, okay? They worked in the advising field in some capacity. Um, this one was really interesting as well. We asked what training, or if there were training opportunities offered at your specific institution? Almost 60% said no, right? And again, we're looking, there's about 282 answered this one and about 27 skipped that question. But over half said, we don't have any training opportunities associated with transfer students, right? When we asked what kind of resources were needed, 60% of those said trainings. Right? They want to better support transfer students. That's why you all are here today, right? This is a training opportunity for you to better support those students you're working with, to create a process for them that you know is gonna get them to the finish line, whether the finish line for them is transferring to that four-year institution, then the four-year institution getting them to graduation. Right, they, they want trainings. And then 35% of them indicated that they want more personnel support. So for all the people with the money, <laughs> just, just throwing that out there, 35% 30, of respondents would really like to have some additional staff, right, helping those transfer students and working with those transfer students. So the Engagement Working Group is using this information to develop more statewide training opportunities for faculty and staff who work directly and indirectly with transfer students. This includes conversations around expanding advisor trainings to include all institutions. Recently, leaders of the summit um, met with, so this summit, sorry, I didn't clarify that. So Donna, Amanda, they were set up with a meeting with um, leaders in Oklahoma, 
So Oklahoma has launched a statewide advisor training. And so we were able to connect and have conversations about how can we expand something like this? Not taking away from you all because you need this particular space to build your direct transfer pipelines, but how do we expand this and use this as a model for statewide advisor training, right? And so that's something that we're looking at. Um, and really, I applaud you all today for coming together, spending this time, and really digging into what's working with your transfer and how we can continue to improve. So the outcomes of the work associated with recommendations four and six include the revision and elevation of current student resources. So what already exists and how can we leverage those and build on those based on what students have told us they're using. And then the creation of new resources for both students, faculty, and staff. Then the communications working group will come in and they're gonna create that awareness campaign, right? Marketing material, social media, really making sure the information gets out there. We're looking at including chambers of commerce across the state, businesses seeking to upskill and reskill their workforce, regional workforce centers and high schools. Those are all spaces where we need to have transfer front and center, right? Remember those half a million students with some college no degree in South Carolina. We need to go where they are. Okay, so back to recommendation five. I told you I wouldn't forget that one. Recommendation five is all about reverse transfer, right? This is something that's already in process. The Transfer Council backed off of this one because there were already so many great things happening in that space between institutions. So our goal is we will come back to recommendation five. We will have some conversations with institutions who have implemented a reverse transfer process and we will say what is working and what do you need help with? And our goal is to then find a platform, a statewide platform that will help streamline reverse transfer for the institution so it's not so manual and laborious. All right, so we've got some next steps for our transfer work. The proviso 117-135 expires June 30th, right? CHE does not have any kind of authority whatsoever to force people to do things they don't wanna do. So we are hoping that we have created enough space for people that they feel welcome and want to continue the conversation. So our goals are ensuring the continuity of the Transfer Council can we get them to continue to meet after June 30th? My hope is yes, time will tell, right? We also wanna make sure we're evaluating our current work. How are we going to make sure what we have put in place is actually working? And so we'll be working with the working groups to make sure that we're doing some basic assessment to ensure that what we've implemented is actually doing what we want it to do. And then the next iteration of work is gonna include these things, right? We've got the launch of the transfer, the Universal Transfer Explorer that's gonna happen in June of 2025. We also need to determine those resources and, and scale reverse transfer, right? Those are high on our priority list as we're kind of coming to, to June 30th, right? I don't wanna say the close, but a new iteration of transfer work, right? And that's really how we're looking at this, is that new iteration of transfer work. So I mentioned three references towards the beginning. This is where all that data came from. I also want to highlight and point out the Commission on Higher Education's website. That website is just chg.sc.gov. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all together now. <laughs> so that website has a Transfer Excellence Center for faculty and staff. That is a huge hub of resources, includes the statewide work, so if you're interested in what's happening, you want to take a look at where we're going, all of those things can be found there, including our new dashboard and the recently released transfer report. So if you want more information about the recommendations, how we got to this work and where we're going next, you can find that in the 2024 General Assembly report for transfer. Please let me know if you have questions. I am here all day and so grateful to be in this space with all of you and really look forward to continuing this transfer conversation. So thank you so much and enjoy the summit.